Welcome to Women of Courage, where you will hear the stories of courageous women, women from all walks of life who have faced challenges along the path of their life journey. Women who've tapped into their inner resources and found the courage to confront, to overcome, and to triumph. I'm Ann Miner, your host for the show, and my guests have all agreed to share their experiences so others may learn from them. It's my hope that these stories will inspire you, that knowing you are not alone in facing the bumpy road of life, you will be motivated to keep moving that you will take action and courageously pursue your own dreams and passions, no matter what obstacles are presented along the way. Just as our Women of Courage have won over their challenges, you can too. Stay with us. We'll be back with today's Women of Courage in just a moment. Woodstock Council discusses hot topics that can affect your future. Hear what Woodstock politicians are saying every Thursday at 7, only on Rogers TV. your beard on? Catch CBC's coverage of the 2013 hockey playoffs from the first round right through the final live on your Rogers smartphone. Download the AnyPlace TV mobile app today and don't miss a second of the action. If you have problems seeing, you go to an optometrist. If you have chest pains, you consult your physician. If you have trouble hearing, who will you see? An audiologist a highly trained professional who helps people with hearing difficulties to improve their quality of life. Please don't wait. You could be losing more than your hearing. Well, with me today is Allison Hankel. Welcome. Hi, Anne. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so glad that you were able to be with us. And I'm really looking forward to having you tell us your story. I know that you've faced some significant challenges and overcome them. So why don't you tell us about it? Um, I guess at my challenges go back all the way to early childhood. Um, I grew up in uh, a home in the Oxford County area, but I was um, a victim of abuse. Um, I ended up through a series of events, I ended up in foster care at 13. Um, I've always had contact with my mother, but I couldn't live with, with her at that time. Um, so I was in foster care at 13. My biological father, who had not really been involved in my life, kind of swooped in and thought he was saving me and took me to Vancouver when I was 15. Uh, so I lived with him there, but practically a stranger, until I was 16. And then I was homesick. So, and I knew everything because I was 16. So I came home uh, to Woodstock and got my own place. Um, so at 16 years old, I started living on my own. Um, I dropped out of high school halfway through grade 10. Uh, not so much because I didn't like school, because I always loved school. I was always a very good student, and it was kind of one of those things that always made me feel good because I got good marks, and it was mm -hmm. all easy. And so I really liked school, but I had to make a choice between paying rent, which required a job, or um, attending school. So I quit school and I started working, and so I worked full-time hours at 16. Uh, continued to work full-time, and then at 18, I met the love of my life and moved to, Va uh, moved to California to get married. Mm -hmm. So I lived in San Diego, uh, had my first child when I was 20, and then my second one when I was 21, at which time their father decided he wasn't old enough to be a parent, and so he left. So I had a two-year-old, a one-year-old, and a grade 10 education, and thought that this was probably not what I had envisioned for my life. 
Uh, it actually wasn't surprising, though, I think, to people who knew sort of the pattern that it had gone on in my life, that I knew a lot of people who had gone through the foster care system, who had dropped out of school early, who ended up young parents, um, and ended up sort of stuck in that. But I made a decision at that time that I was not going to raise my children, struggling every day for every penny. Uh, so I had to make some decisions on what I was going to do, and it seemed to me that the logical thing to do was get an education. So at that time, uh, Woodstock had a program that was run through the Southwest Center, which is still, uh, th I mean, that center is still running. I don't know if they still have the program, but it was a mm -hmm. program called Futures. And what it allowed me to do was get my high school diploma through correspondence mm -hmm. and work part-time, and the play the employer did not have to pay my wages, so they were really not out anything. So Hyde Houghton hired me. Now Hyde Houghton was an accounting firm in Woodstock at that time, mm -hmm. and it kind of becomes full circle. Yes. Uh, but Hyde Houghton hired me. The, the tax partner actually who was there at that time said that anyone who was brave enough to walk in off the street uh, and ask for a job deserved to get one, really, <laughs> sort of what he said. He said, I'd, really, I had no qualification whatsoever to think I could do this job, but I did. Uh, so they hired me, and my job title, I like to say, was whatever no one else wanted to do. <laughs> that was my job. So my kids were, were young, and I started working in an accounting firm doing reception and filing and typing and certainly not accounting. Never really thinking. I thought, well, you know, if I could work in an office as the receptionist, that's, that's a good, I could do that. And the tax partner at the time said, you know, you really should go to school. You really should go get post-secondary education. And I remember thinking, not from, a, not from an intelligent standpoint, because I, oh, I never struggled in school, but I thought, how am I going to go to school as a single parent with two kids? I thought th mm. there was just no, no way that was going to work. But it did. I applied to Conestoga. I was accepted. Uh, I started a relationship with uh, the person who turned out to be the father of my third child, who was born on the first day of exams my second year of college. So before I graduated from college, I had three children. Um, I think because of my childhood and never feeling good enough for anyone, I, my second husband was a great guy, and we got along fine, and we should have been great friends, and we should have stayed as great friends. We should not have, have been married. But I didn't think I was worth a whole lot. My, I remember thinking, when he asked me to marry him, I remember thinking, who, who else is going to want me, right? I'm a single mother mm -hmm. at that point with three children. You know, this is probably the best it's going to get. So we got married actually after Jenna was born, which is my youngest child. So I had three children and was remarried and had just graduated from college and mm -hmm. thought that I had it all worked out. I was uh, pursuing my CGA designation, which is no, Certified General yes. Accountant. Okay. Yeah. So the Certified General Accountant designation at that time, you graduated from college um, and then did correspondence courses while you worked full time. So I worked full time in an accounting firm in Kitchener, I had three children, and did these courses that took between 40 and 50 hours a week wow. to, to do. That's a full time job. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was sort of two full time jobs mm -hmm. and three small children was sort of the way that that worked. Um, but I did it, and I, I, you know, I got asked many times because the, the pass rate for CGA courses is about 50%. So it's not, not an easy program to get through, and I managed to get through without failing any of the courses, and that, the question always was, you know, how did you do that with all those kids? Well, because I couldn't afford not to. It became very important to me that I succeeded in my education, partly to advance in my job, but more to show my children that, yes, education is the answer, that doesn't matter you know, uh, everything else is sort of second to the determination and the education. So I went for it and, you know, made it through, made it through the schooling. Um, but I was working too many hours and my kids were getting bigger and I wasn't quite sure where that was all going. And so I uh, decided that it was time for a career change, uh, moved to starting working for the Ministry of Finance, which was a job I hated. I hated every minute of it. But it was Monday to Friday, 
nine to four. There was no overtime. I made every ball game that my kids played in or soccer game or you know any of those things, and that was very important to me at that time was you know that that they know that I was there. And if you the job that I had before that that just wasn't happening. So it was a priority mm -hmm. shift. And then I moved back to Woodstock. I'd been living in Kitchener while I went to school because my old car wasn't making it back and forth for, <laughs> for the yeah. time I was there. So I did live in Kitchener for a number of years. But Woodstock, I keep saying, I don't know, it keeps pulling me back. This is a, I've been to California and back. I've been to Vancouver and back. I was in Kitchener and back. It's, I just keep coming back here. So I moved back to Woodstock um, and separated from my second husband. Uh, still, I still hadn't quite worked out. I, I, you see, I looked g good on the outside from the perspective of, you know, I got the job and I've got the education and my kids are doing all the normal kid stuff. And I seemed very happy. And my inside and my outside did not match. Mm. I put on a great front. Um, my oldest daughter, not that long ago, said to me that she can't be as strong as I am, to which my answer was that no one is as strong as I pretend to be, because that's all I was doing, is getting through every day and pretending to be happy and keeping all people at arm's length other than my children. They, if anyone has children, you know you can't, they don't, they don't stay at arm's length. Right? <laughs> but everyone yes. else, there was, a, there was a definite distance that I wasn't relying on anyone. People let me down. You know, no one could be counted on. And that was the premise that I operated under, and everyone thought I was fine. When my second husband and I separated, my best friend was shocked. She had no idea there was anything wrong. And that was typical, sort of, of, of the way I functioned. So, Well, let's take a break, and when we come back, you can tell us more. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more of Allison's story. If I were bereft Here's a self-defense technique you can learn in less than a minute. We're looking at a horrible situation. That's when you're grabbed from behind with your arms in. You could be walking along through a parking lot, anywhere. Someone grabs you. First thing, stay calm. What I'm going to do is now is to help give me a little more time for freedom. I'm going to step forwards. Doing so brings my weight forwards, makes it heavier for him to pick me up. I'm going to pivot my hips now, clearing a route. Basically, the strike is growing. I'm going to strike his groin. Striking with the blade of my hand. Strike. Strike. I'll strike until his grip is broken. We pivot ourselves out, push off his chest, giving us space to get away. We're going to look at that one more time, a little quicker. Again, you can be walking along. Someone grabs, step forwards, open up a root, strike, 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 push off. There's one more tip to help keep you safe. Three out of five people with dementia will go missing at some point, often without warning. With a safety plan, you can prevent missing incidents from happening. It's never too early to plan. Contact your local Alzheimer's Society today. Finding your way. For people with dementia, every step counts. What step would I take today? If I were brave. Well, welcome back as we continue our conversation with Allison Hankel. So, Allison, just before the break, you were telling me that the inside didn't match the outside. Right. What was happening? Well, I think I had grown up, um, I was a victim of sexual abuse by a close family member. Mm. Um, when that all came out, no one really knew how to deal with it. I mean, now it's hard enough to deal with, and there's a lot more information out than, you know, when I was 13 years old. I told a friend who promised not to tell anyone. He told his mother. His mother worked for the Children's Aid Society. The next thing I knew, we were in at Children's Aid. And, it, I mean, it was the best thing he could do to not keep that promise, obviously, mm -hmm. but it didn't seem like it when I was 13. It, um, so... Basically, through there were some. There was a long period of time when I thought my mother should have fought harder. She should have kept me. She should have, 
And now as an adult and having talked to my mother, I know she did the best she knew how to do then. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think she would make the same decisions now, but you know, I often say life doesn't have a rewind button. You do mm. what you do. Mm -hmm. um, so I had gone through a process of my biological father leaving when I was two, being victimized by a, a close family member. In my mind at that time, my mother abandoning me. My first husband left. You know, my second husband gave up and, and left. And so I just really felt like I wasn't worth much of anything. If, if your parents, you know, don't fight for you, who's going to? Mm. So the inside was sort of falling apart and thinking I didn't have any value. And the outside was actively pursuing a career and doing volunteer work and seeming very, you know, outgoing and I've never been shy. I, you know, I've all yeah. of those things. So the two really didn't match and very few people knew the inside me so but I did right obviously I knew yes. I knew what happened at night when I was by myself and that I really wasn't as confident as I pretended to be so that was you know the mismatch that happened and it happened for a lot of years that that that's how I how I went I you know came back to Woodstock and I got a new job and I so as I said earlier, that you come full circle because mm -hmm. I now work as the senior tax manager for BDO, which is uh, uh, years ago merged with Hyde Houghton and became one firm. So I'm kind of back where I started with some of the people that I worked with before I went to college. Oh, that's so interesting. But in a totally different yeah. position now. So, um, so I, I mean, everything was moving on, and I thought that I was, I think I had almost gotten to the point where I had fooled myself into thinking that I was fine that you know this was as good as it got it didn't nothing affected me on a day-to-day -day basis I was good um, and then I went through a, a time a period of time where everything sort of fell apart and my uh, daughter started having some problems and I had found out that the I guess not my husband but we had been living together for seven years so with the third serious relationship that I had in my life that he had been unfaithful uh, so you know he left and I was on my own again and I had a miscarriage and I, I didn't miss a day of work though and then I started mm. to look back at that and went okay there's you're clearly not looking after you right um, and I was killing myself with what I now know was the the negative self-talk I was I was terrible to myself. I would never speak to someone else the way I spoke to me. But I didn't really realize all of that um, until I actually started going to church. And that was, there was a program that was run through one of the churches in Woodstock called Celebrate Recovery. And I had never gone to church. Church was not, I mean, I'd been to Sunday school, vacation Bible study, whatever, you know, three times when I was a kid because it was free. <laughs> so it was a good spot to go. Um, but I had never been and then I started going and something changed and I went through actual real healing and went through a process of forgiving people, uh, forgiving people who had hurt me, forgiving myself. Mm -hmm. um, I went through a real process of looking at the things that I blamed myself for. When I was 16 and living in my own apartment, I was living with, for a short period of time with a guy who was 21 years older than me. And wow. yeah, and for a long time I thought that I was a terrible person. Why would I do such a thing? You know, he was married, he had children. How could I, how could I do that to his family? Um, and then as I started looking back on it, I thought, you know what, you were 16. You, I wouldn't blame another 16-year-old yeah. for making bad decisions, right? mm -hmm. I, especially now that my children have moved through 16 and I see, you know, what 16 really is. <laughs> um, so it was, it was a long process of learning to forgive other people for what they had done and learning to forgive myself for decisions I made or didn't make and they, and that all came from faith and that that was the part that was missing and and I kind of happy now to say that the inside and the outside match they're not always great either <laughs> but you know at least they're the same so it's was there someone that helped us to you know support you and encourage you throughout? There's been different people at different times and I think there might have been more people if I had let them. Mm. But because I was so sure before anyone did anything, I was sure that they were going to abandon me, they were going to 
do something, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't let myself. But when I uh, was in foster care, there was a lady who um, was the mother of a good friend of mine, and they became foster parents so that I could live with them. So that sort of stopped my cycle of moving from foster home to foster home. And so that was, that was amazing to me because they went through the whole foster care process just for me. Now since then they've fostered a lot of other kids, yeah. which is great, mm -hmm. but at that time it was someone who had done something specifically for my benefit. So that was, that was amazing. And then I have, I have married now a third time, <laughs> third yes. time's a charm. Mm -hmm. um, my husband now and I have been friends since I was 16 years old. So he's been around for a lot of this stuff and his older brother has always been around. So now my brother-in-law is also one of my best friends. So there's a few people that have been consistently there. And then there's the group of women that I met when I went to the church, mm -hmm. um, who for the first time I felt like it was okay to open up and talk to them. Although quite honestly, some of them were a little shocked at first. They, they hadn't quite heard my story <laughs> before. So it was, but they all did very well. At, See, put on their poker faces and <laughs> tried, not to, tried not to be, you know, judgmental or whatever. So that, you know, we made it through that. And then I found a group, um, I ride a motorcycle, and I found a group called the Christian Motorcyclist Association, and I ride with them. And the group of people that I ride with are amazing because it doesn't matter what my day is, I can call them. I don't have to pretend I've got it all together. They don't believe me anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> that all works very well for me. So it really, I find all kinds of people now who are helping me. And I, I know that they were always there. It was always me saying, yeah, you're not getting in. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, risking, I'm not risking what I think you're going to do to me. So as I've opened up more, surprisingly, there's more people that are <laughs> standing right there to help me out. So. So what message would you like our, our audience to take from our conversation this evening? I think the biggest thing that I try and get to people is that what happens to you as a child may not have been your fault and what you do with it as an adult is up to you. What a beautiful message. Well thank you so much for sharing that with us Allison. I know that you've condensed your journey quite a bit. <laughs> Where to from here? Where to from here? Well, I try, I'm trying now to talk, to get the message out, to not, not so much about what happened in the past, because everybody's got their something. And it could have been, you know, the same story as mine. It could have been a totally different story. But I think the big thing is for everybody to find the ability to move through it. And so for me, it's my faith. That's what makes me move through it. But everybody needs to, to, to keep going. We live, first, I mean, the, the place we live makes that possible. You, there's all kinds of stuff out there. And so I think it's don't give up on yourself and keep going. And, and that's the message that I want to get to people. So that's what I'm doing, that and working. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a perfect lead in. Yeah. We're gonna have a moment of inspiration from one wild, wacky, <laughs> wonderful woman. Stay tuned for Jezebel Peppa. Hello, darlings. Jezebel Peppa here. Darlings, it's wonderful being me, being a star, being successful, traveling the world. But I'll be honest with you, I couldn't do it without my family. You need to spend quality time with your family, darlings. When you get together, don't worry about whether the towels are folded neatly. Don't worry about whether the dishes are done right after supper. Don't worry about any of that. Spend that time laughing with each other, sharing with each other, learning from each other. Let me tell you, your children are too soon grown up and your parents are too soon taken from you. So celebrate the time you have with your family now and remember to celebrate the Jezebel in you. Skate Park is a safe place to participate in physical outdoor activities. I'm Jed Lau, host of Simply Cooking.
Here's a self-defense technique you can learn in less than a minute. And this is a great one for the ladies. You could be standing, you could be sitting on the bus, it could happen anywhere. And this is when someone gets, whoa, a little too friendly. First thing I wanna do is I'm gonna reach over and grab his hand. Taking my fingers and I'm gonna grab what we'd call the meat of his pinky. From here, my thumb is placed on top of his thumb. I'm going to roll and peel his hand off my shoulder to the sky. As I do so, I'm gonna grab it with my other hand because two hands are better than one. From this position, I'm gonna draw my hand straight from here down to his groin. Now I need to get away. So I'm gonna push off on the side of his head, making some space. We're gonna do that one more time. Again, it's a, not a friendly, not a nice situation. So I'm gonna put your hand around you. Hey, I don't like this. I'm gonna grab, hands up, hand, Groin, push, and don't touch me. There's one more technique to help keep you safe. Remember, in every setback lies opportunity. Opportunity for you to call up all that you have learned through your personal experience and from others. To rely on your own core beliefs and values to find your way through to new opportunities and succeed in spite of everything. What if we're all meant to do what we secretly dream? What would you ask if you knew you could have anything Like the mighty oak sleeps In the heart of a seed Are there miracles in you and me? If I were brave I'd walk the razor shield Where fools and dreamers dare to tread And never lose faith Even step would I take today if I were Call the Rogers TV viewer response line at 519-660-7548 or email us with your comments 